Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Sean T. And today we are going to enhance your ability to trust and believe in overcoming obstacles. And we're also going to enhance your ability to win, win, and win internally and externally. So get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say it again. No, no, no. What's up? This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited today because we have Oksana Masters here today. I'm going to read her bio. I want y'all to sit back and just like revel in this and get ready to truly be the ultimate inspiree for the day. So here we go. Oksana Masters was born in Ukraine in 1989 and faced numerous physical challenges due to utero radiation poisoning from Chernobyl. After living in three orphanages, Oksana was adopted at the age of seven. Over the course of seven years, she would have both legs amputated and endure a host of other surgeries. At the age of 13, she began rowing and brought home the first of 17 Paralympic medals in four different sports. In 2020, she won the Laureus World Sports Award in the category of Sports Person of the Year with a Disability. She has been featured in such publications as Sports Illustrated, the New York Times, and the Players' Tribune, and has appeared on numerous television programs, including Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. At the Beijing Paralympics in 2022, Oksana became the most decorated U.S. Winter Paralympian or Olympian ever. Oksana, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Okay, we got to jump right in because I have a lot to ask. (laughs) I have a lot to say. And I think everybody's going to be really excited about this. So take us back to the very beginning. I like when people kind of tell us their story from their eyes, from their experience. And the other thing I want you to do is you can be as open and as honest during the show as possible. Nothing is off limits because people want to be inspired. So the floor is yours. (laughs) I mean, my childhood is pretty typical besides that I grew up in orphanages instead of a normal home, but I was born in Ukraine, like you said, and I was born with a whole lot of different birth defects and was put up for right, adoption right away. And then I came over to America. I was adopted by my mom, but who adopted me as a single parent. That was such a strong, like long, strung out battle for two years. She first of all wanted to adopt a baby, not a seven year old who was very opinionated like I was. And I think she realized that when she came finally to get me, like, oh my gosh. But <laughs> It, my childhood in Ukraine is very, very different than what it is now because, I mean, when I came to America, the doctor said I was diagnosed as failure to thrive. I was basically not, wasn't expected to live a long life because of malnutrition and just a whole lot of things. There was no food in the orphanage, not a lot of heaters. And this is the third orphanage because you're born and you go to like a baby home from birth to three, three to five, you're in a separate one. And then five to 16, that's the adult orphanages and it's a mix. And that's the one I really remember the most of. And there was different types of challenges. And I mean, what people think in orphanages, there's abuse that definitely happened but the weird thing is like I had no idea I was disabled or was different until I came to America where mm. the kids and people were like saying, oh, well, you walk different, you talk, you sound different and stuff. And I, that's the first time I really realized, oh, what's, what's wrong with me? And I am different. I have a disability. And what is that? I think that is very profound. Meaning you're in your country, you are obviously going through the orphanages, which most of us don't even know about and you're in your mind and truly you're thriving and then you go to a different country and you're like you're different that must have been like Mm -hmm. i don't know just kind of not for lack of a better way of saying it just been like a mind like (laughs) it was because well it was like 
that's where I started to kind of like doubt myself and view myself less than because of that and then try to hide everything. But I don't know if it's also because an orphanage, it was just fighting for survival, fighting to have food, fighting to not get hit all the time and all the other stuff and trying to hide and day to day that you're not focusing on the other stuff and was just naturally adapting to that my normal there. I want to go back a little bit, a little bit before that, because a lot of people probably have zero clue. I mean, with context clues, they may know, but utero radiation, Mm -hmm. like talk to us about that. And then, you know, kind of like how you were diagnosed and how all of, you know, the surgeries and everything happened, because I mean, it's your story. So it's easy for you to be (laughs) like, oh, you know, this is what happened to me. But we're all like, wait a minute, oh, this yeah. is huge. I guess, <laughs> I guess, yeah, you're right. I forgot my legs are missing and I forgot. <laughs> but, oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, so way, way, way back. So Chernobyl happened three years before I was born. But what a lot of people don't realize about Chernobyl, and I think they're really, um, it's an interesting fact, is that even to this day, all these years, it happened in 86, I was born in 89, the levels of radiation there is still high, and just as high, if not higher, in some areas. And that's, but that's a lot of years to, for it to still be rising. So when my birth mom was traveling, she has been traveling around that area and eaten something or have been in the area long enough to where it affected my developmental stages process of in her stomach. I don't know, really know much about her side and any of that, if she knew what was going on. But I think it was a pretty big surprise when I came out with looking like something from a grudge movie just crawling out of a tv but oh my god you gotta have fun with it you just no 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 you do i'm like living because you know even (laughs) earlier when you were like you know yeah just my my legs are missing like you say it's so matter of fact but i i mean i kind of like that you accept it in that way because yeah you know a lot of people may be going through that or know someone that's going through that and you know it is this natural thing i don't feel this way but there is this natural thing that when people see someone with with a disability they like feel sorry for them. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I understand, obviously, but you don't even, you don't know their story. Like they could be like thriving more than you in your life just because something else is different. I actually had a cousin, have a cousin, you know, she was born with like a half of her arm and a half of her leg opposite Mm -hmm. ends. And, you know, for me, it was normal growing up with her. And then she got her prosthetic arm and a prosthetic leg. And she was just, you know, living her best life. And it's what we knew. And then when we would go out and people would be staring, all of us, like her cousins and brothers and sisters, we would all be like, it was just weird because it's what we know. But so I understand in that. And then it's funny how like, I'm sure she like, kind of like me, like where, where like she doesn't even, she's probably so used to being looked at that she doesn't even realize it, but you guys see it and you're like, oh my God, why are they looking? And because that has happened to like my friends or my mom and everyone, (laughs) like take a picture. But (laughs) <laughs> it is what it is. It's a cool accessory. It's just different. But yeah. Um, so when the way they found out it was radiation is when I came to America. So because I was born for the birth defects I was born with, where I was born with, with my legs, but I was missing the weight bearing bone. And then the mm. non weight bearing bone looked like a salt shaker was just put across the x rays. It was basically non existent. And the knees were not really knees. My hands were webbed. I had no thumbs and the way that I'm using, I had a whole lot of reconstructive surgeries and I only have one kidney. I have no enamel on my teeth. I don't have my bicep on my right side at all. And I was put up for adoption. The medical care wasn't good there. I had seven surgeries in Ukraine and to try and help a little bit. And they put this weird cage thing on to try and they break the bones apart so it can lengthen and straighten, which obviously the condition I had was not going to do that. And when I came to America, my mom took me to a dentist for the first time and they took x-rays and they saw radiation in my x-rays, my teeth and my grown teeth. And that's where they're like, okay, well, this stemmed from that. The only thing that can strip enamel is radiation and I don't have any of that. So I hate ice cream. And yes, I'm that weirdo that doesn't like ice cream and I don't mind saying it. (laughs) And you don't like ice cream because I was going to say, because if it touches your teeth, it's like insanely uncomfortable. It's painful. Yeah, but coffee I'm willing to struggle for. <laughs> what about water? 
you know, obviously you're an athlete. So do you like room temperature water instead of like ice cold water? I definitely do prefer room temperature. I'm not, and my mom loves ice. I'm just watching her and like secretly judging her like by the amount of ice she's putting in her water (laughs) because I just don't get it, obviously. But then when you're in Tokyo and you're cycling and you're literally just like 12 inches away from the ground and it's really, really hot, obviously the cold water, it's, it feels good. Yeah, yeah. You can, some things are worth that. I mean, it's, it's so many things that we don't even, you know, think about on a daily basis. I know for me, this is the first time I'm actually talking to someone who was, their life is very much different than mine. Because I, I think, you know, one of the things I want to say is, and we kind of touched on this, is we think you're different. But you're not different to you, right? Like we only like, it's like when you came to America, it, the only reason you think or s- people say you're different is because they're taking the mass amount of people here and they're like, well, we're all like this. And, you know, she's like that, but we're all different. And I always say there's no such thing as normal because we're all different. It's so true. And honestly, it's trying to break society's standard and mold of what they considered normal years and years and years ago and centuries ago and stuff and it's just breaking that and it's people like me and people who are have different unique abilities and look different it need to be more mainstreamed and seen more so it's not just all of a sudden oh you're different from me and you mm-hmm. start judging what they don't know or what you don't know because you're not in those shoes so you don't understand it When you go to the grocery store, do you look at the person with glasses or the one with the curly hair and like, oh my God, you are different? No, because you just see it as just glasses or just like a style of hair. And that's the same with prosthetics or a wheelchair or a cane or whatever it is. It's my accessory is just obnoxiously loud and large in there. And I choose to show it because I'm proud of what I can do with it. (laughs) Yes, I love that. And, you know, I did want to say this because a lot of people... There are people who know, and there are some people who don't know what Chernobyl, the Chernobyl disaster is, but it was a nuclear accident that occurred, I'm looking at this for the date, on the 26th of April, 1986, at the number four reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, north of the Ukrainian SSR. It was the Soviet Union, I believe, at the time. At that time, yeah. Because yeah. I was technically like, it was still, it was Ukraine, but under the USSR dictatorship. Fun fact. I worked at a nuclear power plant, my first job out of college. I ran the health center for all the scientists, and it was just, like, crazy. But all of the uh, precautions we had to take and the training we had to have just to enter there, work there, you know, because it was like like one thing goes wrong, and it was a wrap. And so I remember when 9-11 happened, like, I didn't go to work for, I think it was probably two weeks because of, like, the fear of if they were going to attack nuclear power plants, right. obviously. Yeah, because that's the thing is like that area and that land is dead for a very, like right now it's like, it seems like forever, but it's going to be for a hundred more years plus because it's just, it has to, the radiation level there. If people are interested in Chernobyl, there HBO did a, a show about it on, it's called Chernobyl. And it kind of, not to get all political of it, but it gave you a different insight. And it's interesting because like, since you work there, you probably know what some of it like is or whatever, but just the political side of what actually happened and what went wrong and the cover behind it too, because that's what a lot of people didn't really mm. know. So we're going to check that out. All right, back to you. Like orphanages, very challenging, move to the States. I know you said that, you know, you're, your adopted mom was like, wow, she's very opinionated. But a lot of people see and hear someone being adopted as a baby. They're like, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, and they're like, oh, well, they're the only parents I ever knew. And obviously it's similar to you because you were in orphanages. But how was that, you know, being becoming a part of a family at an older age? And then I say older compared to some. And then, you know, what was it like for your mom and like your family and because their whole life changed as well and their dynamic. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you, so my, my mom adopted me. She didn't speak Ukrainian and I didn't speak any English at all. So it was a whole lot of charades gone wrong oh, 90% of the time. But wow. it was, she, she tried and learned a little bit Ukrainian, but like we, it was, so there's that battle of leaving what was my normal, leaving what was my home, and then going with someone that you don't speak the language of and don't understand at all. But my mom wanted a little baby for the reason that baby you can shape. There will not be horrible experiences that you have to work with and work around. And she saw a picture of me and just at that picture in that time, I was five. And that's when she was trying to adopt me. But Ukraine put a moratorium, which is a ban on all foreign adoptions. And those two years I waited for my mom, I looked at her picture and in my memoir and the hard parts, I talk about how like, she didn't know I knew of her. Uh -huh. The director of the orphanage set, told her like, well, she doesn't know you're coming. And she was thinking to herself, thank God, because how will she ever understand this has taken two years and all the political bureaucracy stuff that's going on. But I did know of her for two years and look at her picture every single time they would let me go in the office to look at it. You know, I think when we hear a lot about adoption, we don't, I think a lot of people don't know, is it going to happen? Like, I'm sure that was going through your head. Like, am I ever going to meet her even though, you know, because political and all that. Because I was seven and a half, I saw p kids and friends that went to families and were adopted. And the only time, so like I learned to associate when people come food, which is the only time you get food is when people would come and visit you in the orphanage and for options to maybe potentially adopt. And then all of a sudden they put a dress on us and a big giant bow that's the same size as your head. And you're supposed to just like be really cute. And I remember two specific families that said, we are going to take you home. We're going to be a family. We're going to be your parents, but they never come back at all. And so I was used to it and you kind of, you don't expect it at all, especially when it's so many years. And then when I saw the picture of my mom, the difference of the whole time was with my mom. She never came to see me first. She's basing this off of a black and white grainy picture. It's literally from the grudge. I just am not smiling. There's nothing cute about me at all in that. Not to and you, she just, <laughs> to her well, probably. She, she's not to anyone. I don't know what. She also adopted. She put. We had to put down our dog, and she adopted a ten-year-old blind dog. See, she sees beauty in things that I do not. Oh my gosh! But that's her heart. She just there's those people out there, and she's because of who she is and her heart. People like my mom are come very few in between. There's not. I feel like those many people are out there that are willing to take the grudge, a girl from the grudge, like I'm like home with her. <laughs> But oh my god, your like, analogies are insanely <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's you gotta laugh through it all. Yeah. It's, well, it's my uh, fiance. He literally, if anyone else like you think if you're having a hard day or anything, and mm -hmm. you just like view certain things, he's got a way to turn something extremely catastrophic in a way where you're laughing at it all of a sudden, and you're just laughing through that moment instead of crying in tears. In my memoir, I talk about more of the deeper things that are really hard, but I want people to know that this happens in orphanages, but also it's okay to laugh about it and, and to look, not just dwell in like the really sad side of how it makes you feel, but also laugh at yourself because it literally will add years to your life. Now I just totally got off subject of where I was No, you're going. fine. I think that because we all tend to, just in general, whether we're walking and looking in a mirror or whether we have lost weight or whether we're going to a party or looking at ourselves, you know, with our clothes on, a lot of times people focus on the negative side of things instead of trying to focus yeah. on, well, I do have this, you know, and changing the perspective of what is. That takes me to like hearing about your mom, that heart in her, you know, that purity of like her, just seeing something else, seeing something different than what, you know, the surface person would see or the shallow person would see. It shows how she nurtured you to go after what you wanted to do. So let's talk about sports. Let's talk about just that whole journey because, I mean, hello, I'm talking to <laughs> the most decorated Olympian ever. Can I not <laughs> fanboy right now? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just love to work out because I believe in the queso in and out of the burrito. I'm that kind of a girl. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this worth it. So I'm going to train really hard for it. But yeah, I, it's my mom. She really, she's the, she's the reason I was always active as a child and I always loved to move my body in space and just be, I'm not a physical person or I am a physical person. I'm not just where I like to homebody. And so I, when I came to America, went to Buffalo, New York first and was doing ice skating and my mom got me into that so I could find some friends and a community and then transitioned when I moved to Kentucky, got into rowing when I was. 19. Wait, we can't just skip over ice skating. Like, let's talk about this. Come on. <laughs> we can't skip over. This is like somebody else might be like, oh, you do. like, let's talk about this because I get on. the ice. Listen, I got on the ice this winter with my kids. My kids are five. They were doing pretty good. I'm I'm on that ice skating rink like my knees are bent. I watched a little YouTube video before I went out on the ice. I said, let me tell you something. My big ass will not be falling on this ice in front of these people. And you just like, yeah, I did ice skating. Come on, like, give me more. Give me more. Who was your, who was your teacher, your coach? Like, let me know. It was an organization that was primarily, it was called Saba. I'm not sure if it's still called that. Skating for the blind and handicapped. At that time, I tried it both with my legs. I had my legs still. They were not amputated yet. And then I, I fell in love with it. And they pair you with an able-bodied person who is an ice skater. And they're trying to go somewhere and ice skating, but they're like volunteering their time. And I got connected with Angela Butch, who was just, she's like my sister. She became my sister. And I don't know if you felt this when you tried ice skating, got on that ice. I just love the coldness of my face and how it's just feeling that wind and it's just such an exhilarating feeling and moving your body in a way. And they adapted the skate around the things around my legs. And that's what they specialized in is making um, the actual skate fit around AFOs and fit around prosthetic stuff. And then at the end of the year, you work on this routine. My favorite was Goldfinger by James Bond. We got these cute little like golden dress. And I loved ice skating because I could, the tights that you wear, it makes your legs look so normal and oh. pretty. I really I think I love that side of it. And that should have been my mom's sign of like, oh my God, she's going to care what she looks like. And she's got a lot of opinions on fashion and style. <laughs> I <laughs> love that though. No, I don't like the feeling of the cold <laughs> against my face. Everyone's like, oh my God, your kids are so cute. And I'm like, I want to get the fuck off this ice. It's cold. I'm not trying to be out here. I got to wear all this extra. And I live in Arizona. Like it's not even that cold. So no, <laughs> that's why I'm giving you mad props. So you're saying you're not going to try cross country skiing or you're not going to go do the winter side of sports. Well, did have you done cross country skiing? Well, yeah. then I would do it with you. That's what I compete. I would do. I'm, that's what I know. I know. I'm saying like I'll do it with you simply because. Don't do it with me because I did. <laughs> I also like have a tendency of breaking my body skiing stuff, and so I don't know if I'm the best person to do it with. Well, I mean, it's kind of motivating, you know, and you're funny. I would have a good time. That's why I'm like, oh uh, yeah. But let's move into that. Let's get to the Olympics. Like I'm super stoked about like how. What was the process of getting there? Well, so I got the sport that I got into was rowing to the Paralympics. And I started that and I was 13. And my mom, once again, she was the reason why I was in sports and went down that path. But at first, I didn't want to do it because they introduced me to this program as adaptive rowing. And at this time, I'm 13. And that opinion that I was talking about is there. And I'm like, okay, well, why do I have to be classified into another category? I'm already categorized as being disabled because of my leg and at this time I have my I've had my left leg amputated when I was nine my mom made that decision she waited till I learned English and I bonded to her to have that second one amputated that absolutely needed it and I finally after my mom was very persistent I went out and tried it and I fell in love with it the minute you just push off the dock and I was balancing and every time I moved the oars whatever I did was straightly just like resulted in whatever the movement of the boat mm. was doing and so ice skating is different because I was still limited in certain things but this is the first time I felt truly free and felt in control yes. in a way that it's still I didn't really feel that when I was walking in my prosthetics that's pretty amazing. and then it, oh my gosh, get into rowing. Everyone needs to do it. It's, I say, 
I've done a lot of sports. I'm very, I blame that I'm being a Gemini, but <laughs> I think a lot of guys won't understand this analogy. And I haven't put this wedding dress on yet either, but I call rowing like my wedding dress. It's the minute I got into that boat, I knew it was the one. And all these girls and all the people say that, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the dress. So I'm assuming. That's what it feels like. <laughs> like, yeah. And it was that for me. And I fell in love with it. But the, when I got into rowing, it wasn't too set out to be a Paralympic athlete. I had no idea that existed. I never saw anyone that looked like me that was competing in high level representing Team USA. And I, I, I watched the Olympics for fun, but not like, oh, I'm going to be that one day. I want to do that one day because I never saw someone like me doing right. it. And then in 2008, I was introduced to one of the directors at the Louisville Adaptive Rowing, he was saying, you should get, you should look into the Paralympics. You're really young. You have a future. I'm like, what? The para what? And I Googled it. Just like everything in this world these days, I had to Google it and look it up and fell in love with the idea of representing something so much bigger than yourself mm. and representing a country. And on top of that, this was going to be an opportunity for me to represent what my mom did, which is adopt me as a single parent, be a Ukrainian American athlete and coming from all these things. And people read like you've achieved this, this and this, but what they don't know is I also, I set out to make the 2008 games and I did not make those games mm. at all. I made them in 2012. And it was one of those things. I don't know if you've been in a position where sometimes when you don't achieve it or you don't get what you work so hard to get is when I realized how bad I wanted mm. it. And then that made me realize, okay, I'm, this is not just something I, I think is a fun idea and will be fine. Like I actually was devastated and I wanted to get that even more and was committed fully to the point where I had to, I moved away from home for the first time and all this stuff. And long story short, 2012 is where my Paralympic career kind of started. So before we jump into that, I did want to say uh, you make a, made a good point. And maybe other people who are listening will think about this. So now that I'm 44 years old and I've been through like a bunch of stuff in my life and challenges and, you know, all that stuff. And I love being competitive. Like I realize it's mm -hmm. something that I need. It's actually something I'm going to talk about in therapy on Thursday. But today I was talking to my coach because I'm doing a – uh, physique competition for the first time this year. You just kind of like made a light bulb go off in my head. I'm like, no, like I'm going there to win, you know? And, I, and I, I'm, I'm already set that if I don't, I'm doing it again. Today, I literally almost threw up. You know, you know how like you're in those workouts or you're training and you're to the point where if I really want to do this, there's no way that I could let my mind stop me from doing this because of the burn. I'm like, it's not going to kill me. I might throw up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to probably scream and yell. It's going to hurt really bad. So I want people out there to think instead of waiting till you don't get it, like not that you did anything wrong, but it's like go after something as hard as you possibly can. But I love that you were like, no, I didn't get it. And that's going to, you know, put some fire and to I my butt. I think my mentality at that time was I was 17 around that time too. So I think that's and then when you don't make it as a 17 i didn't understand the magnitude of what it is and i've set goals but this was very different kind of a goal mm. and I, I i think of me now where when i transitioned from other sports so i've competed in london and for rowing but then i transitioned to a different sport my problem is now is exactly what you just said. I, when I try something, I set the bar way up here instead of realistic, like, okay, I've never done this before. I get into cycling and I'm going to make it to the Paralympic games instead of, oh, I'm going to maybe see if I can ride for 30 minutes straight before I just like not <laughs> die. So like now it's interesting how my, my mentality and goal setting has changed as a 17 year old to when I was 23 and made London, but then after that, yeah. I think I'm in that same mentality of just set that bar high because, oh my gosh, what if you actually hit that bar and surpass exactly. it? Exactly. And then like, it's okay if you don't, cause you know exactly what to do to do it the next time. And what I also like, 
there's no perfect timeline. It might take you four or five times. I didn't get my first gold medal until my fourth Paralympic Games over 10 years after I reached set out to achieve that gold medal. That's incredible. I was always at second and third best. And, and it's just knowing, like, don't compare yourself. And it's going to be easy to do. But, yeah, it's interesting because I, I think I have the same mentality now with you. Tell me about the first time, like, your first – competition like you're walking out to wherever the, the starting line is or like like tell me oh about gosh. that process and how you managed your nerves well I did not manage my nerves <laughs> at that time <laughs> I'm not gonna pretend like I did at all I, my legs inside my legs were shaking I was terrified and we have to walk on like on a dock because for rowing you you walk out and it's God, well, it, it first all starts when you wake up that morning and you're putting on USA, that, that uni. And then first of all, I was like, gosh, I've really got to get away from spandex uniform sports is really what my <laughs> first thought was. But then like when you put USA on, it hits you different and you see that and you look in the mirror and it's just like, shit just got real. Yes. This is not just my own, um, <laughs> my own goal. I'm now representing an entire nation and my rowing partner. And when I say I did not manage my nerves well, I, I had to learn because I threw up before every big event. And it was just because in some ways, like I was kind of not thrown into it, but it's not like I could just talk to someone that was, hey, this is what you're going to expect. And this is what you're going to feel. This is what you should do. And so the first games, my nerves was not good. Mm -hmm. And then but then the final, what happened in rowing at the first, at the Paralympic games, we're sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Like my throat is closing in. I can feel it like pounding so hard and like my heartbeat's already like peaking and I haven't even started. I'm just sitting here and <laughs> freaking out. And I'm thinking to myself, my body, this is my body's way of, and maybe I just said this to myself to like shut my, my body up a little <laughs> bit. But I was like two things are happening. It's preparing for battle. My body knows because I've put in the work and the hours and time. So it knows the start line. It knows what's about to happen and to not let my mind get in the way of letting it do what it trains to do. But then also looking at these like fear and the anxious, like the anxiety that comes and the fear and the excitement and like the, the sweats and everything that's happening, your throat closing. That is a reaction because it means something. What you're about to do, it means something yeah. to you. And that is the greatest thing because if you, if I don't have that feeling on whatever I'm doing, it doesn't mean anything to me. And I'm not going to be able to put 1,000 plus percent that it's going to take to reach that goal that I, I set. That. And I don't know. So, yeah, but then I've learned now to process my nerves and before and every start line, before I do any race now is I, I'm big in breathing and trying to do like breath work and trying to calm down everything in the nervous system. And we'll, I'll breathe in really slow and hold it and say, I am, breathe out and then say strong because there's so much power in the word. And if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm nervous. I'm so nervous. This is good. This is going to go wrong. I didn't do this. Then that's what you're going to focus. And that's what's going to be the forefront of your mind in the process. And you're not going to go on autopilot. That's so good. Where... If you like breathe in, your it's like like your nervous system is calming down because of that breathing in for three, holding, release for three, and then you're also telling yourself you are strong. And I I did I am strong pound for pound because I'm I'm a tiny girl. <laughs> I know that. Okay. It's fine. I have on my conquer your mind. That's why my tattoo because I think that it's the foundation of everything. Like while mm -hmm. your body has this reaction your mind can kind of change. You're probably not successful 90% of the time or most of the time, but if mm -hmm. you practice it, it becomes more successful over time. Let's talk about how many medals we have. Like, let's, let's brag a little bit. Let's, <laughs> let's be excited for ourselves. <laughs> well, cause I got it wrong the last time I forgot. <laughs> like, I don't keep track of it all, <laughs> but my first medal at the Paralympics was in rowing in London and it was a bronze. And I kind of, I crawled my way to finally get to the gold medal. And in Sochi in 2014, two years later at the Winter Games, 
I ended up like I just started skiing and was not really fit or di- wasn't really good. But surprise everyone in the entire team when I um, got a silver and a bronze medal. Yes. And that silver ended up being the first medal for Olymp- for Team USA, Olympic or Paralympic in 20 years. Wow. And that was wild. Not games was really special to me because, well, not the fact that it was in Russia, but it was special in the fact that I, in the sport of rowing, I competed with my rowing partner, Rob Jones, who is also a double above the knee amputee. And he was, he's a Marine and he had his legs um, through an IUD explosion. And so we were together and I honestly... I think I'm the athlete I am because of him. I learned to be the teammate I am because of him. I learned everything, the work ethic, because of just watching him. Kind of like I watched my mom have that resilient and that fight and that kindness at the same time and still being just a really amazing person on top of it all. It's all through watching and absorbing and letting that be my core foundation as a person and even though I crossed the line technically first, and I like to tell him, Rob, I pulled you across <laughs> that finish line because I was in bow and he was in front. Um, I, part of me was questioning, what did I contribute to this boat? Because he was so much stronger than me, and there's he's just a lot of muscle and strength, and which I, 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 I question, like, what did I contribute? Could they, did would we have achieved this if I wasn't in the boat? Is it did I have anything? So in Sochi, when I got, it was just me, myself, and I on mm. the start line. Whatever I put in and whatever happens, it's me. And this was my first time at the Paralympics seeing what I could do as an individual. And do I really belong here with these elite athletes representing Team USA? And that silver medal is one of the most meaningful medals to this day because that vel- helped me realize I do belong here and helped me because I don't. I doubt myself sometimes and question myself a lot. In Sochi, 2014, silver and bronze, and then I made it to Rio. I had an injury, a back injury that took me out of rowing. So it's not that I chose to do other sports. It was a situation happened where I broke my back. I didn't have a choice to row again. And I transitioned into cycling, and I really wanted to make the team. And there I got fourth and a fifth place. I made the team, but I was so angry. (laughs) And that is the biggest, when you get fourth and you're like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And literally when I crossed that finish line, I'm so happy that there it was a road race and, and speakers were let on because I did say <laughs> like at the yeah. end, because it sucks to get I fourth know. place. You're just right there, especially when you know what you did wrong and you just instantly in that moment. So I did not medal in that one. And then later on I did. Well, you said something about if you weren't in the boat, his name is Rob, right? When you were with Rob. But like, you do know that you were a high contributor to that, you know, that medal. Uh, Somebody had to pull him across the finish line. But that that prompts me to ask you because I love that through all of your, you know, your coming of age story, your overcoming obstacles, overcoming obstacles that you didn't even know you had until somebody pointed it out. How did you manage to continue to trust and believe throughout this time, even like today's struggle? And that's why like I said, like there's like a fine line of like doubting yourself, but then using that as like motivating yourself. And I believed in what I wanted to achieve and I know I could do it. And I just, but then at the same time, like that little tiny voice in your mind starts talking to you. But it was my whole entire life where in the orphanage, started out way early on. We're like, well, you're never going to get a mom. You don't deserve a family. You're not going to get X, Y, and Z. And, and then my legs are amputated and society's telling me, well, you're not an athlete. Oh, you're too small to be an athlete. You can't go represent Team USA. That's an unrealistic goal. And so it's a whole lot of my life was proving people mm. wrong. And what I ended up realizing was in the process of trying to prove people wrong, I was also trying to prove to myself wrong too so it's like it's weird because it's wanted to prove myself i am capable of it i'm gonna like i believe this inside this feeling i have i'm gonna show you that it's it's real and i can and my motivation was for those those underdogs those people who are looked at as like oh they're not gonna be able to like get here and and i i guess like what made me believe is as I got older 
and took every single setback and failure and and then the good parts and the success of it too. Like I believe in finishing what I start and I, regardless of where the result is, I'm going to do what I can and put in every single hour, make every single day count. And if that puts me dead last, that's where I am today, but I'm not going to settle there. I'm going to go and redo it to where I get to where I want to go. It's something that I'm still, to be honest, trying to find and and do at the same time because I believe in myself, but then I also am like, I doubt myself in my own worst critic too and will be the first one to tear myself down after a good race. I think it's safe to say that it's okay for like trusting and believing yourself is ongoing. I think it's it's easy for anyone to answer the question be like, oh, this is something that I overcame and like, that's what you should do. But I think there's something really great in being, while I have acquired a great ability and techniques to trust and believe in myself, I'm still going through the process. And I think that's like a tangible thing for people to take away, especially someone with all of your accolades. You know what I'm saying? I just, I just want to tell you, continue to slay <laughs> the game. Do you hear me? <laughs> but you are amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show uh tell people how they can find you and follow along because you know i feel like you're also fun off the 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 athletic fields <laughs> <laughs> well i am competitive and no matter what i do i've been banned to play risk because i threw the board <laughs> because my rules don't take over ukraine and that's what happens yes. <laughs> so no one will play games with me anymore <laughs> fun. but um yeah you I, I mean, people want to follow. I'm on Instagram. I'm more of a, it's easier, like an Instagram person at Oksana Masters or Twitter or Oksana Masters USA. And I'm just a girl with no legs. I just say like I'm oh best God. of both worlds. I'm literally. But like there's some days where I'm five. That's why my Instagram tagline is like sometimes I'm five, eight, sometimes I'm four feet, depending on the day because I downsize, which is nice. I'm literally going to follow you right now. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let's let's continue this banter on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna be following along in oh. your first competition. Oh my gosh, that's thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Hopefully you'll see me get much bigger as it goes on. As it goes along. But thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs>